Now I'll we'll introduce our speaker for the moment. Uh, he is on our museum staff, and he is also assistant curator at the Confederate uh, Museum up in Greenville. Oh, you're curator, curator now. All oh, right. That's <laughs> <enough. laughs> Uh, so, without further ado, an evening with Mike Morgan. Um, I don't know most of you, so I'll introduce myself. I am Michael Morgan. Um, I have a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree from Eastern Kentucky University and a Master's from University of Oil. I was a history minor in college and a, uh, for my BA, a uh, liberal arts major. So I took quite a bit of history, but I never became a historian. Uh, unfortunately, I spent most of my life as a polymer research chemist, which was exciting, but different. I, uh, since retiring, I am the, uh, as I say, the curator at the, uh, one of the curators at the Confederate Museum downtown in Greenville, <coughs> and uh, I've been involved here for what was that, a year now, I guess, a little bit. And, uh, so without further ado, I'll start on today's topic. The execution of Isaac Payne. If you ever get a chance, to find one of these books somewhere, buy it. It's a great book. Uh, this particular one, it's a first edition, it's signed, it's a great book to have. And it'll tell you a lot about this man, which we actually know very little about, considering he's from South Carolina, but there was just not a lot written about it, other than when he was executed. He was uh, born September 23rd, in 1745, and he was the son of Isaac Hayne I, who was born in 1714, and uh, Sarah Williamson, and the grandson of John Hayne, who came here sometime around 1690 from England. And they lived in the St. Bartholomew Parish in Colleton County. And Isaac Hayne Sr. was a prosperous planner. Uh, they say that he is, at the time of his death, he was worth about 19,000 shillings, which was, or 19,000 pounds, rather, excuse me, which was quite a bit of money at the time. He was a rice planter in the Lowcountry. <coughs> in uh, July, of 1765, Isaac married Elizabeth Hudson. She was the daughter of the Reverend William Hudson, who was the pastor of the Independent Church of Charleston, or Charlestown, as it was called then. And they settled at Payne Hall, which was four miles from Jacksonboro, uh, on the uh, Pon Pon River. The Pon Pon is a tributary of the Odessa, so down in that area. Uh, as I say, it was about four miles from Jacksonboro, and they were right on the river. So it was a, uh, a good place to grow rice. <coughs> is, uh, the plantation itself was about 900 acres, pretty good size, and they were, he was quite prosperous. He uh, also owned two other plantations in the area, one of which was 700 acres, the other one was 650. And uh, beyond that, he had five lots in Buford and two lots in Charlestown. He had an additional 6,377 acres in the upcountry. Now, I'm not exactly sure where, but I'm guessing it was in the York District because he also owned half the interest in the ironworks there in York. And they produced 
before the war, just general iron, skillets, pots, pans, whatnot. Uh, during the war, they produced cannon and cannonballs for the American cause. Let's see. He and his wife had seven children. I do not think they all lived to adulthood. But in fact, I'm sure some of them did. Uh, his first child was Isaac, his son, and then he had a, a Mary. And his last two children he had in 17, I think it was 78, the last two were born, were fraternal twins. And one of them was named Mary. And the older girl had been named Mary, so I'm thinking she probably died. But otherwise they would never have named one of the children Mary. Uh, the other child was named Wendy. When the British assault on Charleston came in 1776, Isaac Haney had a uh, company of militia. Uh, he was a captain of the militia. He had 160 privates and 13 officers that uh, went to Charleston. And they were in the city during the uh, ruckus out at Fort Moultrie. So the British never got to them, so they never really did much of anything while they were there. He went back home, and we don't really hear anything more about him until the British come back in 1780. Now, when that happens, there's he was a captain of the militia before. At this point, he was a colonel of the militia. And we don't really know how he wound up in Charleston. We do know he was not in Charleston when the capitulation came in Charleston surrender. So he was not paroled at that time as one of the militia. Uh, there, there's a number of different theories about where he was. Uh, one of them that says that his company was 200 miles away in the back country and they got captured and taken to Charleston, uh, which is not likely. In my opinion. Uh, another set theory is that he voluntarily surrendered, hoping that he would be paroled back to his plantation like everybody else was. And that when he got to Charleston and surrendered, they said, no, you're going to have to sign a oath of loyalty, loyalty or we won't let you go. I don't think that's the case because there's another reason I'll tell you in just a moment. Uh, another theory was, and I agree with this, he's probably covered under the Articles of Capitulation to begin with. So he just went back to his plantation and stayed there until we know that sometime he eventually wound up in Charleston and the main reason would be because his wife, three of his children, and about five of the servants had come down with smallpox and he needed medical attention. He went looking for a physician, any kind of medical supplies that they had at that time, which was not a lot. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, he wound, wound up in Charleston, and the authorities would not let him leave until he signed an oath of loyalty. And there's, the British said that he signed an oath of loyalty to the king. He says he signed an oath that he would remain a subject of the British and he would not take up arms against Britain again. But nothing about anything else. That was his opinion of what he signed. And uh, that was actually confirmed by the uh, uh, then governor of South Carolina that that was what the oath was at that time that he took it. Unfortunately, one of uh, General Clinton's last things he did before he went back to New York and left Cornwallis in charge was he reneged on his <laughs> uh, parole for the people. And he said, instead of that, uh, you know, you won't take up arms, that's not good enough. You've got to swear an oath to the king and you've got to take up arms for the loyalists. 
you you got to decide one way or the other, or we're going to hunt you down. And that did not sit well with a lot of people. And, but a lot of a lot of the militia that many people who became famous afterwards, uh, such as Andrew Pickens, had signed an oath that they would not take up arms again against the king. And in fact, Pickens did not for a long time. But uh, he eventually was forced into it because the British went back on their word. Part of what the, the word was was you were under the king's protection. But they were not. The loyalists stole everything they had for the most part. And his plantation was gone through several times. They took a great deal of rice. They took, you know, it was a perfect place to go to get food for the troops in Charleston. And the British did. But at any rate, he signed that oath. Now, in order to know what's coming up next, we're going to have to tell you a little bit about what happens between August of 1780 and July of 1781. Because this is what caused what eventually happened. Start with Cornwallis <coughs> defeats Horatio Gates at uh, the Battle of Camp. Uh, Gates was the supposed hero of Saratoga. Uh, there's serious doubts whether or not he really had that much to do with the victory at Saratoga, but he gets credit for it. He lost horribly at Camp. He was, his army was routed completely. He I rode that 200 miles or something to get away from the battle. And, so, and that was on August the 16th of 1780. On the 18th, uh, Bannister Tarleton attacks Tom Sumter at Fishing Creek, which was also a route because he snuck up on them. They didn't see him coming. They just ran right over, ran through the camp. I think Sumter barely got away swimming across the river to get away from them. When these two, you know, they also, Tarleton had defeated uh, the Buford at Waxhaws during the Western. So everything was going in the British's way. They were, they were taking the state. And the, most of the militia was rolled back. They didn't know what to do, how to deal with this. So Cornwallis decides he's going to move his army toward Charlotte and into North Carolina. And he orders Major Patrick Ferguson to take his troops of militia, loyalist militia, and move them toward Charlotte also, which Ferguson does. Unfortunately, he winds up on top of a place called King's Mountain, and the uh, up country, the back country men, the over the mountain men, surrounding, decimated the troops, kill him, and what they, who the, the ones they don't kill, they take prisoner. Uh, so that slowed them down considerably. Meanwhile, Gates had been removed from command of the Southern Army, and the command had been given to Nathaniel Green, which is who Washington wanted to have it all along. But Congress wouldn't listen to him. But they finally listened and put Green in command. And he actually took command in, uh, on December 2nd, 1780. And things started to turn around immediately. Uh, first thing Green did was he decided he couldn't feed all the troops he had, so he split his army. He sent Daniel Morgan with about a third of the army west to forage. And then he went east. And Cornwallis did just what he hoped he did. He split his forces too. And he sent Tarleton after Daniel Morgan, who, much to Tarleton's dismay, he caught up with at a place called Calvin's. And uh, it was a, a horrible defeat of the rich. And this was the first time that uh, 
they have really stood up to British regulars and using militia as half his force defeat them. It's a, it a major victory. And I think Tarleton got away with about a hundred men. And he had about a thousand to start out with. So, you know, ninety percent losses are bad. Cornwallis was not a happy camper. And so he decided, well, he's going to pursue Morgan and try to keep him from catching back up with Greene, which he couldn't catch him. And he made the decision to burn all of his supplies, extra baggage and whatnot, to get down to just what they really did, absolutely positively had to have so they could travel light enough that maybe they could catch him. And it didn't work. Daniel Morgan, because of illnesses, went back to Virginia and he was basically done for the war. But uh, Green led Cornwallis for a chase across North Carolina to the Dan River, which he got there first, crossed, and took all the boats with him. So there were no boats for Cornwallis to use, and it was miles to the nearest fort. So, uh, and because the dam was up at the time, that time of year. <clears throat> After that, uh, Cornwallis drops back down into North Carolina, and Green, after he gets his army straightened out, requit, uh, fed, he comes back into North Carolina, and they meet at Guilford Courthouse on March 15, 1780. Grueling battle at the end of it. Cornwallis held the field, so he technically won the battle, but he lost a little over a quarter of his army in doing it. Killed and wounded. And because he had burned all his baggage and all his tents and everything like that, the day after the battle, though, the night after the battle, a horrible rainstorm came up. So these men were lying out there in the field, wounded, dying, in the rain. And there was nothing Cornwallis could do for him. He had no medical supplies, he had nothing. So, uh, actually, Ward Germain in England, when he heard about the victory, said a couple more victories like that, we're done. You know? <laughs> Cornwallis uh, limps to Wilmington to get resupplied, and then instead of going back to Charleston, he decides he's going to go north into Virginia. And he eventually winds up at a little village on the coast in Virginia called Yorktown, where he settles in. Joe Green, however, decided to go back to South Carolina. And he came back into the state headed toward Camden. And Lord Rowan, who we'll hear more about, who was commanding the British Army at that time in South Carolina, met him at Hobkirk's Hill and defeated him. And, but Green, as he always did, uh, got most of his army away and to refight another day. And after about two or three days, Rowland decided that he couldn't hold Camden, so he pulled out and took his troops to Monk's Corner. So this become a pattern for Green. He didn't really accomplish through battle what he wanted to do, but the end result was he got what he wanted. He got him out of Camden. Uh, and then uh, this, this happened uh, on April 25th. Now, the month of May was a really good month of 1781. The month of May was a really good month for the American cause. Uh, let me see here. On the 11th, Sumter captures Orangeburg. On the 12th, Francis Marion captures Fort Mott. On the 15th, Light Horse Harry Lee and his legion captures Fort Granby. 
And on the 22nd, Lee and Pickens start the siege at Augusta. So everything's going their way at this point. And the British are reeling. They don't know what to do. The, the, they keep asking Clinton for reinforcements and they're not getting any. He's not sending any men, he's not sending any supplies, he's not sending them anything. Uh, a little bit of food, that's about it. But most of the time they're out scrounging around in the neighborhood around Charleston, robbing the plantations of the people who, most of whom, had signed oaths of loyalty and were supposedly under British protection. But they were losing everything they had. At this point, uh, I think it was on May 24th, yes, from Monk's Corner, Rowden and Lord Rowden and Nisbet Balfour, who was the command of the Commandant of Charleston, issued a joint proclamation asking the people to remain loyal to their oaths to the king and not to let the militia lead them astray. Which was pointless, but they did it. They didn't agree. Also around that time, sometime between May, uh, May 24th and mid-June, Lee, Marion, and Green started closing in on 96, which was the last really British outpost in the, in the back country. They uh, started the siege, which was not going well because they didn't really have any heavy artillery. They had a couple of three-pounders and a six-pounder, I believe. It was all the artillery that Green had at the time. And none of those guns were big enough really to take down the fortifications. What they really needed some twelve pounders or better get some eighteen pounders. But they didn't have anything like that. Lord Rowden marches from Charleston to the relief of ninety six. And the day before he gets there, he arrives on the twenty first. On the twentieth Green goes ahead and pulls his army off and moves, moves away. I think he goes to the high hills. Uh, the next day, Marion captures Georgetown. And Francis Marion was always active. Rowland pulls back out, takes his troops back to Charleston, and I think it was Colonel Kruger, who was the commandant at 96, decides he can't hold this any longer, and he pulls out also and takes his troops back toward Charleston. They actually go to uh, Johnson <coughs> and set up a campus there. So at this point, everything's gone wrong for the British. They, it, in August of 1780, they controlled the whole state. And in August of 1781, they've got Charleston and a little, they can't wander more than about 10 miles away from Charleston unless they're in large groups because Marion and the militia are waiting for them. They're, so at this point, we don't really know what Haney, or Haney rather, excuse me, was doing at the time other than he was apparently obeying his Harden, who was the local militia leader, and from Francis Marion to come back to the American cause. Well, by the time, end of May, probably in 1781, there had been enough victories on the British that he decided, well, since, since the British have moved back into Charleston, they're not really controlling the land anymore, and they, I took an oath to a conqueror. I don't really owe them anything, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, the oath is over. So 
he, he uh, accepts a commission from Marion to be uh, a colonel again in the militia and starts raising troops and that are starting to go around and impress uh, supplies for their own use from the locals. Probably made them no more uh, happy to be seen coming up the road than the British, actually. But in July, uh, somewhere near Charlestown, Colonel Hain and his men captured General Andrew Williamson. Williamson was a loyalist general who was uh, in really tight with the British. They had given him a general's commission and loyalist to the corps. And this got Balfour extremely upset because he figured certain that they would kill him. And so he sends uh, Thomas Frazier and the uh, South Carolina Rangers to free General Williams. And they come upon Hain and his men, and they kill about 12 or 13 of the men, and they do get Williams, Williamson, and they capture Colonel Hain and take him back to Charleston. Now at this point, once they get him back to Charleston, they send him to the uh, provost jail, which was at the basement of the exchange building in Charleston. And he spends the next few months in there. Uh, not months, uh, is it July? So he spends about two or three weeks in there. Balfour was waiting for Rather than to come back to Charleston, he's gone somewhere. And because he wanted to discuss with him, what am I going to do with this guy? I want to hang him because I want to make an example of him. He signed it up and he went back. And the, there is some justification for this. Cornwallis had issued an order uh, earlier that year, actually, that any man who was had come to them voluntarily and signed an oath of loyalty and then took up arms against them to treat just like they would a British soldier who did the same thing. Which is a summary execution. And it's no trial up to the commander to decide. And this is what uh, Balfour thought the situation was. And when uh, Lord Loudon came back, he agreed that yes, that's 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 what it is. So uh, it's on uh, July 26th, Hain gets a note from the town major that he is to appear before the board of general officers to be tried the next day. <clears throat> and then later that day, he gets another note from the same officer saying that instead of a council of general officers, at a trial, a court of inquiry composed of four general officers and four captains will be assembled for the purpose of determining under what point of view you ought to be considered. It's very significant it's changed that because that is the exact same wording that General Green had used with Major John Andre when he was captured as a spy. Now, at the time, to be tried for treason, one needed a trial. That was not a, up to the military to decide whether it was treason or not. That was a trial required. However, anyone caught as a spy could just be summarily executed by the military. They didn't need a trial. He was caught as a spy. So, uh, when they changed the wording, it was pretty much the handwriting was on the wall. That this is not really a trial. And on the uh, 28th, uh, Robin and uh, Balfour gave a uh, joint 
statement uh, announcing this. They were sentencing Cain to be executed on July 31st at 6 o'clock for raising a regiment to oppose the British government, though he had become a subject and accepted protection. Payne had a lawyer, which had not been consulted during this tribunal, and he immediately filed a protest that they didn't have the right to do this. And Payne himself, in his notes that he kept during the uh, inquiry, noted that the members of the court were not sworn. Witnesses were not questioned under oath. He had no counsel with him. And anyone could see from the questions he asked that his not having any witnesses called, that he did not know he was on the trial for his life. That nothing had been said about this being a trial. And there was nothing like a trial about it. They weren't swearing witnesses. They didn't swear him. Nothing. Uh, on the 31st, when the day arrived that he was to be executed, he received a 48-hour uh, reprieve. And this was because Rowden and uh, Balfour were considering pleas people were making. Uh, there were a number of prominent loyalists in Charleston and other people in the government and whatnot were asking for clemency for it because of the uh, problems with his wife's family, with his family. Uh, his wife and two of his daughters died in a small box. He had about five, I believe, of the servants also died. They didn't care. Two days later, they got another two day, uh, 48 hour reprieve. I believe they were, at that point, still being petitioned by the city. When all those were heard, on August 4th, they took him outside of Charleston and hanged him. There's an apocryphal story that um, one of the, uh, his friends actually said to him, you know, I, I, I hope you're going to show these British how a true patriot dies. And he said, I will endeavor to do so. Probably never happened. That's kind of like, you know, Nathan Hale. I have but one life to give in my country. He never said that. <laughs> that was propaganda. That's what they compared to. Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> but he did, he did uh, get to see his children before he died. They did let him see them. And his body actually was given to his 15 year old son, Isaac take back home to bury. And for some reason it was not actually he was not actually buried until the twenty seventh. Um, not sure why. <coughs> but it took that long. But it comes up in a minute why it's important. Okay, the aftermath of this, um, what, was, what did all this prove? Well Nathaniel Green, I believe it was ten days after his hanging that he heard about it and had enough details that he wanted to, had gotten details from Marriott about it, that he wanted to write a letter to Balfour saying, why did you do this? You, know, you better have good reason for this, otherwise I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to hang one of your officers. And, uh, and, and I'm cutting off prisoner exchanges from now on. We're not exchanging prisoners. And uh, Balfour writes back basically that he was under order the board of office to hang these people. <coughs> That's basically his deserters, the equivalent of being a deserter. Uh, Green also writes to Congress asking for approval for retaliation. And uh, <coughs> approval about what he's done up to that point, you know, cutting off prisoner exchanges. 
and he also wrote to Washington about it. And they exchanged letters back and forth. Congress approves stopping the prisoner exchange and the threat of the death of the retaliation. But they don't go so far as to say, yeah, hang somebody. And Washington urges caution. He says, if you had Balfour or Baldwin in custody and you wanted to hang one of them, that's a go for <laughs> Hanging an innocent man for somebody else's crime. That's hard to explain to history. So he was not in favor. In the meantime, uh, Francis Marion decided that he would uh, get some revenge of his own. So uh, he decides he'll go after Thomas Frazier and the Rangers, people who captured him. And he is down in the area around Jacksonsboro. And he finds out that the, the night before, Frazier and his men had spent the night, uh, this would have been uh, August 30th, they spent the night before at Hain Hall, camped out, down by the river. And he says, I'm going to lay at the Hain So he gets his men, he, he decides, he thinks they're going to take a, a particular road that's going to lead to the nearest ford across the Odesto River and to go back to Charleston, which is what they figure he's going to do. So they line the road on both sides with a, in a nice stand of trees where there's no way for them to escape and land wait for them. They come, when they come through, three of these men, once they start shooting at them, they got nowhere to go but just keep going. Because if they try to turn back, that's just going to make them congregate, make it even worse. So they basically are running a gun. He kills over half uh, of Frazier's men. Uh, Frazier himself was wounded severely and barely gets away. Uh, he's trampled by the horses after he falls off his horse. They do, you know, Francis Marion would not have even considered, much less countenance, the execution of the prisoner. But he had no problem whatsoever about killing armed men. And he got his revenge for Hay. After that, uh, on September 8th, the Battle of Utah Springs <coughs> happened, and uh, Green now had plenty of British prisoners. And they took quite a few officers at the beginning of that battle. As prisoner. So he had plenty of prisoners to use as leverage. The British at this point realized the game was up. On, on October the 19th, Cornwallis surrendered his army to Washington. And so any thought of executing anyone else from the, from the British point of view went out the window. It, it didn't work. It didn't really stop the militia from going back. <coughs> the rebel cause, and there was no point in it. And, uh, Green, and although it went on for almost a year after that, well into 1782 and maybe even the beginnings of 83, before they finally decided to just drop it. There was actually a, a call in Congress to execute Cornwallis <coughs> since he had given the order. And they had him at that time. But they decided, well, that's going to make Washington look bad because he promised all these men, you know, they would not be retaliated against in their surrender. So in the end, Isaac Cain's death was pointless, really. He was killed to try to stop people in the militia who had given their parole from going back to the militia. And it didn't work. Uh, it probably did for about a, two or three weeks, maybe a month. But after, actually after Marion had wiped out Frazier's men, the, the, the militia grew, the number of people. 
coming out to join you. Does anyone have any questions? Would, would not, because he was killed, would not um, Patriots come forward in because they were upset about it and join? They were angry, but they were afraid. <coughs> the ones who were in the same boat he was in. That's right. The men, most of the men around Charleston had, were in Charleston during the, the siege. So most of them were on the parole and under the same edict he was. That, and they were under the British thumb, so they had, had to sign the oath of loyalty. So it, it did slow them down for a little while. But after, after Marion, uh, the feet of Frazier, uh, the militia started uh, gaining men by the handful. Yes? What was it about the hanging? After he was told that he could see his family, he, he was asked if, what would he want. And that was the one thing, he wanted to see his family. But he also, he wanted to be hanged a certain way and they wouldn't do it. They put him on the wagon. Well, I hadn't yeah. heard that. Now, I did hear that when they put him up on the wagon, uh, he asked the, uh, the hangman was fiddling around with the hood and he asked him what he wanted and he said, I'm going to put this hood over your head. He said, well, I'll do it. And he did it himself. And then he actually signaled the, the horse. The horse, the guy with the horse yeah. the moved the car. I there, read there, that. Was, there, was, there was something though, that he wanted to be hanged a certain way and I can't think of that one. I know Andre wanted to be hanged in his uniform, and they wouldn't do it. But because he was captured out of the uniform. Well, why did they say what they compare him, or he has been compared so much to Nathan Hale? Well, simply that he was a martyr. Okay. Uh, yeah. He didn't deserve to be hanged. <laughs> Wanted to hang him for depredation or something, you know, like a fine, you know. But he, but he, he, was, he, he did feel that he was giving his life, though, right? Yeah. For the. Uh, you know, I don't know that, you know, why is Patrick Hill famous? You know, he was a spy, got caught. <laughs> That's what happens to spies. Well, wasn't it because he was just so young and yeah, now they, he had some good things going for him and then they... Uh, he had been a school teacher. Right. You know what they did at school kids? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I took a tour, a history tour down in Charleston, so you never know what to believe when people are telling the stories down there about it. And one, of, one of the stories they told them was about Isaac Payne. And that that the gallows was down Broad Street. They weren't quite sure exactly the location, but it was down Broad Street. And according to his story, is that Broad Street was lined with people from Charleston that were supporters of Isaac Day to see him off. Uh, that is the, the, the rumor, yeah. It's, he was outside the city limits at the time, but it's still you know, it's part of Charleston today. But, they actually took him outside of the city to, to hang him. He did walk to his execution. He did not ride. He didn't want to ride. Yeah. Otherwise, they would put him in a car and he just sat on his coffin. He wouldn't do that. He put it behind me. So maybe the guy's story was based in truth. <laughs> there, there are a lot of people turned out. Uh, the British formed a square around the gallows. Uh, they, uh, I think the British troops were on the front and the back of the square, and the Hessians were on the sides, so that the crowd could not get near the gallows. Because there was there was enough people there, they were concerned about people trying to break free. Yes. Was there anybody else in South Carolina? Executed under similar circumstances? Oh, please. Um, Lord Rowden uh, hanged, I don't know how many people in Camden. Uh, they didn't even ask, you know, one of the things they say here, that 
when they said there was a hanging, they didn't ask who. They said, how many? <laughs> uh, he, he was a, a stickler for that. But, <coughs> Hain is famous because he was a wealthy planter. He was part of the American aristocracy. And that made the difference. That's the reason people were outraged about Hank. Not because of his situation, really. It'd be, you know, you don't hang the go. Maybe you should. <laughs>